And Esau seethed with resentment against Jacob over the blessing his father had blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, As soon as the time for mourning my father comes around, here it is, I will kill Jacob my brother. When the time for mourning comes around, I will kill Jacob my brother. And Rebekah was told the words of Esau, her elder son. And she sent uh, and she sent and summoned Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Look, Esau, your brother, is consoling himself with the idea he will kill you. So now, my son, here it is, listen to my voice. Isn't this great? Just the way they keep picking up on this same motif. Listen to my voice and rise and flee to my brother uh, Laban in Haran. And you may stay with him a while until your brother's wrath subsides, until your brother's rage against you subsides, and he forgets what you did to him. And I shall send and fetch you from there. All right. So one small thing with regards to biblical narrative I want to point out to you here, because it's an odd moment, and and students are often confused by this, uh, because uh, as modern readers, we like verisimilitude. We like realism in our texts. Here's the hiccup. Esau said in his heart, as soon as the time for mourning my father comes around, I will kill Jacob, my brother. And Rebecca was told the words of Esau, her elder son. Students want to know, um, where did, where did she, where did she hear this? If he's saying it in his heart, how is that out loud? And it just turns out it's kind of a narrative, um, that is uh, in some ways, um, affirming precisely what's being said in dialogue. And it moves the plot forward. So we want that realism. We want him to be able to say it out loud. We want him to say it to another so that it makes more sense that he's doing it. And can we make sense of it? Of course we can make. Maybe he's mumbling it. Maybe this is how she hears. More than anything else, the whole point here is to say, ah, the dialogue is now reported inside of the narrative and it's moving the action along here. And so uh, she says, I want him to forget what you have done to him. Notice, forget what you did to him, (laughs) which means you've done something to him. He wants to kill you for this. And what's he done? And here, you know, I'm hesitant to say he stole his birthright. No, no, no. He bought his birthright with some red, red stuff. Now, we talked about last time, right, but, you know, should, should brothers really be game in each other to buy that birthright with red red stuff uh probably not no but is it deceptive no stealing the blessing here yeah pretty deceptive but rebecca may your curse be on me she owns this she actually owns this for for jacob why should i be bereft of you both on one day this is not going to end well for you. And you know she has in her mind, if Esau comes up against Jacob, it's not even, I mean, it's not even going to be a fight. Esau's the one out there who hunts things. He's the one out there who, who appears to be much tougher than Jacob. Jacob is a tent dweller. And here's what I love most. Jacob's a tent dweller with his mother. And a lot of students want to say, oh, he's a mommy's boy. Uh, uh. Not the way we mean mommy's boy. If you mean he's a mommy's boy because he watches her and he watches how she acts in the way in which she's always overhearing and listening to Isaac, sure, he's learned things from Rebecca, right? He's learned things from her. And now, and this is my favorite part of this whole narrative, now you go to my brother Laban. (laughs) It's like, you're going to go to the very source of the way in which I've learned to deceive. You're going to go and live with my brother. Uh, this And it's just going to be just really spectacular uh, narrative with the Rachel and Leah story here. 